one of the things that's sort of unique about Six Flags is they <clears throat> they had a kids area that they had uh, roller racers and the kids could get on the roller racers and drive around and try to like them like bumper cars with the or demolition derby with the roller racers and so the roller racers we have in the basement right now that if anybody rides them they were bought at Six Flags over Texas because of that thing that they did there. Three boys, Brian took more to baseball than than the other two did, and he played baseball from the time he was four until he was in a junior in high school when he started playing guitar. And you know, he and I would I would help coach the team, and part of the time it was like coach pitch, and the the boys had to swing at a ball that was thrown at them, not on a tee. And one season I got to be the pitcher. And so when I was pitching, it was always how well could I throw the ball to where it would hit their bat by accident. So, and then part of the time, those kids, you know, they were so, so young and they really didn't understand the game the way that they would later. And sometimes they would hit the ball and then run to third base. And you'd have to yell out and run to first base. And if they hit the ball in the outfield, then all the boys would all run in a big group and try to get the ball and, you know, fight each other to get the ball and throw it back in. So, but Brian really enjoyed playing baseball. He played with his two best friends, Glenn and Shane. And I was, again, pitcher for part of the, the time he was playing, which I enjoyed doing. That was all in Georgia, by the way. When we were in Georgia, we lived outside of Atlanta, and it was pretty close to go to what they a park they called Stone Mountain Park, and it was a great big rock sticking out of the ground about 2,000 feet, and one of the sides of that rock was a hiking path, and people would just hike up to the top of the mountain on that hiking path, and um, I remember. <clears throat> David, every time he would want to walk up, he'd get a stick, like a staff, and he would walk up the, the path with a stick. Stephen was a little bit older by then. He was like 12 or 13 years old, but Brian was only four. And every time we went up the mountain, I had to carry him on my shoulders. And we got pictures of that on our wall here. And he would never walk up. It was always, Daddy, carry me. So that's what we would do. It took us about 30 minutes to walk up and about 20 minutes to walk down. And by the time you got to the top, you could see all around Atlanta. It's really a fun place. They, they also had a, 
<coughs> small little um, railroad uh, train that went around the mountain, and everybody liked riding that. That's what we would do. Sometimes in the evenings they would have a laser show. They would have laser lights on the side of the stone mountain where there were carvings of pe people that were prominent in the Confederate War, in the Civil War for the Confederacy. And so they would have music and these laser lights would sort of um, trace various images on the, on the rock. It was something that we always enjoyed going to see. Michigan in 1990, um, that summer we, we bought a house that didn't have air conditioning in it. And that summer, it was so hot one day, we decided to get in the car and just drive. And so we drove uh, up to a place called Bad Axe. And when we were outside of Bad Axe, there happened to be a road sign <coughs> that said Bad Axe was three miles away. And so the, all three of the boys got out of the car and we took their picture under the Bad Axe 3 sign. So we had three Bad Axes in the picture. It was epic. Anyway, so after that day, um, we finally got air conditioning in the house so we could, we could survive in here. We also went to Chile in 1988 and again in 1991. And the time I went in 1981, Stephen went with me. And that was his first exposure to any kind of ministry. And I kind of felt like that's kind of what fueled his heart for ministry, the fact that we went on that, on that trip in 1991. He was 16, and all the girls down there just fell in love with him. And it, they all gave him a great deal of attention, and he liked that a whole lot. Uh, Mom and I always would help sponsor youth events. So if the youth group was doing something, and it would depend upon the age of the, of the kids, you know, who was involved, until we got up here to Michigan, because Brian was always involved. Mom and I was always going, and Brian was, he was a little bit young for it, but he always went, even though you know, David and Stephen were a little bit older. So those are whatever the youth were doing, that's what we were doing. I said earlier, when I was a little boy, one of the things that I really liked was the product of a car. And so I was really happy to be able to have a job that was in the car business. And there were a couple of really uh, significant things that happened when I was working for GM. I got to work with what they call launches, which is when you take a product that's just been designed and you, you get ready to sell. You start building it. And when all that happened, there's a whole lot of problems. This is the right thing for a good engineer to be involved in. And so that's what I did, is I helped solve the problems at launch for interior parts of the car, seats and um, moldings on the inside and all the where the instruments are mounted and the carpets in the top of the the inside what they call the headliner that's what I did and I really enjoyed every bit of that I also took her to Canada one time you know when I was working she was in the hotel just reading that particular hotel in Canada had 
um, nice little uh, activity area so um, she could do other things other than just read. Is this Toronto? Yeah. I think you took me too. Yeah. It was in Toronto. There was a McDonald's mm -hmm. attached. Was there? Yeah. Or some sort of shopping mall with a McDonald's. Okay. So, one other thing that we got to do is we got to take David and Brian both to the Grand Canyon on one of the trips I made out to Phoenix, Arizona. And, you know, that's an awesome place to go to. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. That California was, Angels spring training. That was 1994 when we did that. Got to meet Rod Carew. Brian got to meet Rod Carew, he said, who one of the best slap hitters of all time. You know, he would swing the bat just just a little bit, and then he, he could always just hit the ball. He and Tony Gwynn, they could just hit the ball, no matter where. So they were really good hitters. One of the things that it was a big part of my life when I was growing up in my 20s, particularly. I really liked playing softball. I told you earlier, one of the things I did as a kid was play baseball. And so as an, a young adult, I was able to continue that by playing softball. And we were on a very competitive team, one that won the Texas State Championship one year. And later, after I quit playing, they won the actual national championship. They were that good. And I was good enough to, to at least play with them. So I was a pretty good softball player. And then, you know, when, when the boys were getting old enough to be able to play, I was always volunteered to be coach. One year I coached and all three of the boys were on the team. At least that was two or three years in a row probably. David was willing to play at that point. You know, so, and then... I continued to play as an older adult up into my late 40s on the men's team and I enjoyed playing softball a whole lot and when I was playing on the men's team we always had trouble getting enough people to play and so Stephen and Brian were both uh, interested in playing with us and so you know there were times when it was three axes on the team Brian and Stephen and I I was I was lead pitcher and Stephen, I sort of taught him how to pitch. And he, he pitched for the youth team and he pitched for the men's team sometime. So, and Brian played outfield since he was fast. One time he broke his hand out there and he continued to play in that game and later had to get a cast and continued to play even with the cast. So he's probably got pictures of that. And two of the products I did were launched in Mexico, very close to where Brian worked in some of his exhaust product at Chrysler. Uh, so it was in the same general city. And so I, I would go down there a lot to help launch that product. A couple of times I got to take mom in uh, with me. And so I got to expose her to all the small little Mexican restaurants that I'd learned to eat at, eat at, and a little bit of the culture and a little bit of the scenery, which really wasn't all that scenic, it was really poor down there. And so when we, when we went, it was fun to go down there. What mom do during the day? Stay in the hotel. She, she'd take books. <laughs> and one of the other things I did that was, I'll never, ever, ever forget is when 9-11 happened, I was in Germany, and our work day was at, at the end, of, you know, Europe being ahead of the U.S. in time zones, I was at the end of my work day when it was all happening, and so we were, we were all collecting around televisions that, that were available to us to see what, that, that the planes had crashed into the buildings, and so building are we talking about? The one that's westernmost? Um, let's see. Yes, sir. Did you hear the explosion oh, from yes. your position? Yes, we did. As a matter of fact, we, we heard it and, and 
because I was just like standing there pretty much looking out the window. I didn't see what caused it or if there was an impact. So you have no idea right, right I now? I have another one. Another plane just hit. <gasps> right? oh, oh, my God. Oh. Another plane has just hit. It hit another building. Oh. Flew right into the middle of it. <gasps> Explosion. Oh my God. It's right in the middle of the building. This one into the East Tower. Yes. Yes. Right in the middle of the building. And right now? You know, we were... <clears throat> everybody was afraid of what might happen afterwards, not knowing that it was only going to be a, like five planes uh, hijacked. Nobody understood the scope of what was going to happen. and We, we were in Russelsheim, Russia Germany, when all of that was happening. And the uh, people that were in charge of us told us, well, you all just stay together. Don't go running around on your own. And so we, we walked to our dinner time every night as a group and <clears throat> we were also told when you call home don't don't say anything uh, specific about where you are or what you're doing just be very vague Just say we're okay and you know we're, there's plans being made to get us home because they closed all the airports at that time and it was GM had to charter a big really t typical of a regular commercial airliner. That's how they got the group of people that were over their back. And there were several people because it happened to be the same time as a Frankfurt auto show over there. And we flew back with a bunch of executives and a bunch of media people because they were over there for the auto show. And we just happened to be given seats on that airplane to get back. We got back five days later if we had tried to get back commercial, it might have been two weeks because all the commercial flights were canceled for a long time. Because, again, the authorities didn't know how big a scope all these attacks were going to be. So they had to ground all the flights. And one of the people that we flew back with happened to be Paul W. Smith. He's a very famous broadcaster here in Detroit. I saw him sitting on the you know, like in the chair waiting to, you know, to go through through the boarding process and all that. You know, in addition to all the GM people that were over there. So, again, never forget that.